in Mark chapter 8, we're going to start reading in verse 27. And I would invite you one more time to stand with me just in honor of God's word here. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get me, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of the things of God, but on the things of man. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we want to set our minds on things of God. We need your help. Lord, in this world, we need your help. Lord, in this world are many conflicts. And over in Israel right now, they are faced with many, many challenges with the neighbors all around. And we would pray, Lord, that you would bring peace there, that you would bring wisdom to the leaders of Israel. Lord, that you would bring the supernatural conviction of your Holy Spirit to draw them to the true Christ. Oh, Father, do your work there. And Lord, as we open up your word this morning, we would pray that you would open up our eyes to see wondrous, beautiful things from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Like many of you, I spend a good deal of time on the computer, and I have to do a lot of work on the internet. And in this day and age, and you have probably been very aware of this, with our video editing, our audio editing, with the help of artificial intelligence, we're more prone to be duped by scams more than ever, because they use celebrities' images and voices to promote many different sales gimmicks. Tom Hanks had to go and create a, um, a, a short video as a disclaimer that, no, he's not supporting some dental plan. And even the image that's created by... Artificial intelligence doesn't quite look like him, but it's similar. Yeah. It is imperative. It's imperative that we learn to discern what is real from what is false. That we accurately ascertain what is true. Because why? There may be some serious, serious consequences. And it's not just the loss of money. In the passage today, Jesus asks his disciples two questions. And the second question that he asks is the single most important question that could ever be asked because that question not only went to the disciples, but it comes down 2,000 years later to you and me. We have to be asked that question. We are asked that question. But more importantly, we have to answer that question. And our answer to that question 
will determine our eternal state, where we will spend eternity. And so here we see in this passage, Jesus is continuing to train his disciples. He's continuing that preparation for the disciples to carry on the ministry of Jesus when he leaves in the months ahead. And this question and then the answer to that question that's declared, it will evoke a strong reaction from two different people. And this is a lesson that we're going to learn a lot from. I'm really excited about this, and I think this is really one of the most important messages uh, that comes out of this book. And it's the answer to that question, who do you say I am? So our main point here is it is imperative that we know exactly who the true Jesus is and understand his vital message of salvation for mankind. And that's the main point that we're going to see here. Uh, in, in this first, it, it's short passage, in verses 27 through 30, we see that the Messiah is declared. The Messiah is declared. Now let's look at the setting where this happens, we see this in verse 29, the first, uh, or first 27, excuse me. Um, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Now, he was in uh, the north part of Israel just prior to this, uh, it, near the town of Bethsaida. And he makes this 25-mile journey north with his disciples. He almost goes out of Israel, but he's still in Israel. And he goes to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Herod Philip developed this town. It had been there for a long time. But he developed this town in his time and named it after Caesar to honor Caesar and to gain some favor. And then he also named it after himself, Caesarea Philippi. It is different from the Caesarea that's on the coast of the Mediterranean, very different city. And so he brings his disciples this 25 miles for an object lesson. Now, an object lesson is a lesson that it's a teaching method that uses a physical object or a visual aid to explain a lesson. And unless we understand what the physical object is, we're not going to get the richness out of the story, and we just typically pass by it. And this is really exciting and interesting to get the fuller picture of this. So he mo moves 25 miles north. And if you see that white uh, diagonal line uh, on the map there, that is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon rises to about 9,000 feet. So they've made their way up to the foot of Mount Hermon. And they come to this area just at the foot of it that is now called uh, Banea. I just lost the term. I didn't write it down. Banea is the, the old term that was used, which is taken from Pania, P-A-N, which is in reference to the Greek god Pan, okay? Pan was that Greek god who was half goat, half man. The hindquarters uh, were the legs, uh, the hindquarters of the goat uh, were his legs, and then a, a human body with goat horns. And we think, oh, yeah, the pan pipes. I like those little pan pipes. They're so pretty. This was a god of fertility, a god of nature, it was a God whose worship was absolutely immoral. And here in this area at Caesarea Philippi, and you see this cliff before you on the screen, you see a cave off to the left, and then you see this little arched niche that's there. That was where the statue of the God of Pan was placed. Not only was Pan worshipped there, but also 
Caesar, also uh, nymphs and dancing goats. This was a place of debauchery. It really went back to the worship of Baal, which was a Canaanite god, prior to it becoming a temple to Pan, this goat man. Now, out of this, this cliff face, the cliff itself was about 250 feet wide, about 100 feet tall. It, it was the largest rock face, really, in Israel. And so this was a significant area that Jesus brings his disciples to. And in the worship of Pan, uh, they would take goats, sacrifice them, throw them into this grotto, that big cave that you see there, and out of which came a river. And you can see that in the foreground of the picture. Uh, it's changed a little bit over the millennia because of earthquakes and, and ground movement, but the same thing is there. In fact, that river there is one of the three tributaries that creates the Jordan River. And they would slaughter these goats in the worship of Pan, throw it in there, and if the goat sank, the sacrifice was refused. If the goat floated and came out, it would be accepted. That was part of it. But there was also other debauchery, immoral stuff, bestiality with goats there. They also, at times, would sacrifice their own infants there to gain the favor of the gods. Now, that cave area was called uh, the Gates of Hades. The Gates of Hades. Part of the belief system was that uh, the, in the uh, fall winter time, the gods would go back to the underworld. That's what Hades means, the abode of the dead or the underworld. And the gods would go back there until springtime came and they would come back out of this place called the Gates of Hades. To this place of demonic worship, Jesus brings his disciples. And you and I would think, why in the world would he do that? He wanted to create the perfect object lesson for his disciples to understand what was going to come. So, we see in verses 27 through 29, the great question is posed. And reading that, he says, on the way, his disciples, uh, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, this episode out of Mark is also in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 16 and Luke chapter 9. So when you start taking all the pieces of this and put it together, it is so significant. And the people said, or the disciples told him, John the Baptist. And the other said, Elijah. And others, the prophets. He's asking, what's the popular opinion of me? They had just spent the last two, two and a half years with Jesus, going around all of, of the Galilee region, interacting with the people, hearing the crowd, seeing the healing, the, 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 the deliverance from demonic beings, all that's gone on, and the teaching itself. And so he, he asked them, What's, you guys got your fingers on the pulse of the community, what do, who do people say I am? One of the prophets. Oh, yeah, they mention a couple of them, John the Baptist. Now, I don't know how quite they get that one because John had lived at the same time as Jesus, interacted with Jesus, and then had been executed by Herod. But they said John the Baptist. They said Elijah. Well, that was an Old Testament prophet. Well, was he brought back to life and brought here? Uh, the book of, uh, I believe it's Matthew says uh, that, that uh, Jeremiah was one of them. Okay, what does this mean? 
Well, you know, John the Baptist and Elijah were called to be forerunners of the Christ, the coming Christ. So you could see that people were saying, yeah, this Jesus is someone special. He's, he's, he's different from anybody else. And he's got, he's, he speaks for God. But they got it wrong, didn't they? Because he was much more. He is much more. And popular uh, uh, opinion still is out there about who Jesus is. And you ask people all across the spectrum, who is Jesus? You know, and they'll say, oh, he was a good moral person. Uh, he, was a, he was somebody who, who uh, was a good teacher. He was an enlightened master. Yeah. Today's in, uh, opinions basically hold that he was a moral teacher. He emanates something of the divine in the world, but he's not God. And that is entirely wrong. And we as Christians need to get a hold of who Jesus is, be able to know what the truth is, and share the truth. Now, it may not be accepted. We understand that. But we still have to speak the truth because as the Bible reveals who Jesus is, that is what we must speak. And so then the second question is, is posed. And that second question, but who do you say that I am? And he's speaking directly to his disciples. Who do you say I am? So this has gone from public uh, or popular uh, opinion to what's your personal opinion? What's your personal take on who I am, Jesus is asking. And Peter shares, on behalf of the 12, I believe, uh, and we, we see the statement he makes is incredibly direct. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. You know that that question, the who do you say I am, is one that, like I said earlier, we all have to answer. Because our eternal life is in the balance with the answer to this and Peter here says, you are the Christ. Now, they had made statements about this before, but here is something very different. You are the Christ. He's sitting, he's standing there looking Jesus in the eye. And he's saying, this goes beyond me just mentally saying that you're Messiah. To me, putting everything I am in your hands and leaving everything behind to follow you. Well, hadn't he already done that? Yes, but you see this is a progressive call for Peter and the disciples to follow, to leave behind, to change your attitudes toward who Christ is. And it is a process Oh, we may have some great breakthroughs right at the beginning when we claim Christ, when we accept the Lord as our Savior. But there's a lot of work that needs to be changed or, or a, lot of, a lot of issues that we have. And that's called sanctification, isn't it? That's being made more holy, walking in that holiness, shedding away the old man, putting on the new self. Uh, the Bible talks about all of that. And that's where we're, we're going with this. But who do you say that I am? And the great confession is proclaimed. You are the Christ, he says. Now, if you couple Luke and Matthew together, Luke says, you are the Christ, the, the Christ of God. And Matthew says, adds the little phrase, and the son of the living God. So if we take all that and put it together, 
Peter would be saying, you are the Christ of God, the son of the living God. And what does he mean by all that? Well, when you look at Christ, who is that? In the Old Testament, the word Christ, which is Christ is Greek. Uh, actually, it's English. Uh, Christos would be Greek. And then translated to Hebrew would be Meshach, Messiah, which means the anointed one, the chosen one, that holy one who is sent from God as a deliverer, as someone who is going to lead his people, as someone who is going to redeem his people Israel. That's Messiah, Christ. You are the Christ of God, Luke says. Well, what does that mean? It means that Jesus, this person, is of divine origin. He comes from the Father. Not only that, he is God. And then you have in Matthew, the son of the living God. When you have the word son there, what does that mean? He's of the very essence of the Father, the same substance as the Father. Jesus would rightly say, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. The same essence. And then of the living God, the son of the living God. In the Greek tradition, the God Pan dies. He dies. The statement is made here, the son of the living God, the God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never dies. He is the living God. If we can just believe that one statement, how radical would our lives be? How radical would it change us, our perspective? Because we're made the children of God. We have the right, as we believe in him, as we receive him, we have the right to be called children of God. And if we're children of God, then this is, this is where we are enveloped. That you, Jesus, is the Christ of God, the son of the living God. And how radically that could change us. But you know what? Again, sometimes we don't let it affect us the way it should. Impact us the way it should. Change us the way it should. You can keep your finger there in Mark and turn over to Matthew chapter 16. This is that other passage, uh, parallel passage to this. And if we look in verses 17 and 18, there in verse 16, you can see Simon Peter said, replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah is what that means. Blessed are you. You're made happy. You're made full and, and, and fulfilled in all that God has for you. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Who? You didn't get this from yourself, Peter. God himself revealed this to you. To have a revelation of God that forceful, that powerful. Can you imagine how Peter felt when he's hearing these words of Jesus? This was from God the Father himself that I'm speaking. It's not flesh and blood that's revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then you see a future work. Jesus speaks of something that is yet to come that is not now. We would, in the New Testament scheme of things, they call it a mystery. That which has not been revealed is now being revealed. Verse 18, and I tell you, Jesus says, you were Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
Whew. Let's unpack this a little bit. I tell you, he says, you are Peter. The Greek word here is petros. It's a feminine, or excuse me, a masculine word, which means a little rock, a stone, maybe a boulder that we would call a big, you know, not a huge boulder, just a, a good-sized stone. Peter. Now, you remember this out of 1 John, maybe. Jesus changed his name from Simon to Cephas, which means Peter. Way back at the beginning of the ministry, but now Jesus is bringing this up. There's a point I'm going to make here, Jesus says. You're Peter. You're the little rock. And then, on this rock, I will build my church. That second rock there, that, wor that word is Petra. And that is a feminine word, completely different, that means a giant monolith. A huge, massive rock. You're Peter, a small rock, but on this rock, he says, I will build my church. Now, what is going on here? Remember the object lesson. He's probably facing them. And the rock is behind him, that whole uh, area of worship. And this massive rock monolith, 250 feet wide, 100 feet tall, is behind him. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, is he saying upon this rock back here where the temples are? No, he's not saying that. He's using it as an object lesson. There is a massive rock that I'm going to build my church. Now, Jesus could be referring to the massive truth that Peter had just confessed. You were the Christ, Jesus. Or, Jesus simply could be saying, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Either way, who is he pointing to? He's pointing to the fact that Jesus is claiming to be the Christ, the anointed one of God. And on this, he is going to build his church. And the disciples are probably looking around. What's a church? This is the first time the word church is actually used in the New Testament. Kind of interesting. It's the Greek word ekklesia, which means called out ones or the assembly, the congregation of people. It was a new concept for a new age that Jesus was going to institute. Oh, prior to this, God had been working through and to his people of Israel to proclaim the truth to the world, which they didn't do real well. They proclaimed it to themselves, and they held the, the Torah, the, the, the law, and the prophets to themselves, believing that salvation came to the Jews, and you had to become a Jew, Jew in order to be saved. But now there's something... A twist. Remember, we've been talking about all these tweaks and twists that Jesus is doing with the disciples' way of thinking. Here is probably that biggest twist. We'd seen them go through Tyre and Sidon out of the land of Israel to minister to the Gentiles, then went down to Decapolis to minister to more Gentiles and to give his grace in, in the feeding of the 4,000. And now he's going up to Caesarea Philippi, and he's talking about this church, this assembly, this, this called out ones that are going to be put together. And that's us. And the church of Jesus has existed for 2,000 years. Oh, it hasn't been perfect, has it? We haven't acted like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all the time. But the church has existed and gone up and down. And, the, and it, notice who it belongs to. He said, I will build my church. This church right here, Calvary Crossroads, who does it belong to? Don't you dare say Pastor Jim. <laughs> oh, Jim's church. Yeah, no way. 
I, I, I can't take credit for that. I don't want that responsibility. It's Jesus' church. So what we do here represents Jesus. I will build my church. And notice he says in the future tense, I will build my church. It's him who does the growth. We preach his word. We teach his word. We encourage one another. But it is God who causes the growth in you and in me. That is so beautiful, that seed that grows in each one of us as we devote ourselves to him and his word and, and, and that fruit then comes out of that, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Oh, that's what we long for. I will build my church. We don't have to worry about it. We just keep loving him. We keep devoting ourselves to him. He will build us up. And that doesn't necessarily mean numerically. We always think, oh, yeah, yeah, we got to have a, you know, keep expanding and things. No, we got to keep just plugged in. Oh, we could use the other, other analogy of the, of the branches in the vine, and we're connected to him, and he'll bear the fruit. How beautiful that is. And the gates of hell shall not prevail Against it. Whew. The gates of hell, it says. That's a mistranslation. It should be Hades. The abode of the dead. The place of death will not prevail against the church. Now, I don't know about you if you've got a gate to your backyard. What is that gate for? To keep things out. Maybe to open up and let something pass through and close the gate. The gate's over Hades. That's a defensive position. Now, you've got to keep in mind that grotto that's shown there uh, on that, the picture of uh, Banias was called the gates of Hades. So they're looking not only at the large cliff, but they're looking at the grotto and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Showing that the church is to be living and active and moving against the strongholds of death. We are not to be encompassed by these four walls and staying in these four walls because you as a member of the body of Christ, as a member of the church of God, don't live here. We assemble here and then we're called out into the world to bring his light, his love, his care to the world. And if we're just sitting amongst our Christian friends and that's all we're doing, we're not doing what we should. He's called us to so much more. Mm. And I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They're not going to stop the church of God. And that doesn't mean we go out there and we start picketing everything and yelling at people. And, and it's not that kind of fight because we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of darkness. And that's done through spiritual means. We pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and use it effectively. We're protected by putting up the shield of faith that will quench the fiery darts of the evil one. We gird ourselves with the, the belt of truth around us. You know, it's interesting because at the end of the book, Revelation, chapter 1, Jesus says this to John, Fear not, I am the first and the last. 
and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. He's got them. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Praise God. And so after this revelation here, this understanding of the church, the understanding of who Christ is, <laughs> Jesus' mission is revealed in 31 and 32. But we got to go back there. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Whew! Wow. He began to teach them. This was not the only time he says it. He keeps saying it from here on out. Now, you've got to understand, too, this is taking place about six months before his execution. He was executed the end of March or the beginning of April. That's when Passover was. You back up to six months. That's October. That's right about where we are. So Jesus has six months to plug into his disciples. What are all the important things you need to know? And so he began teaching them what? That he must suffer. Hey, dude, this isn't the message that I think needs to be out there. We need to promote who you are, Jesus. Messiah, the Messiah's plan here was misrepresented in common conventional thought. Uh, the Jews had been raised up with the idea that Messiah was there to deliver them from the hand of the Romans and uh, put them down and elevate Israel and bring a, a, a period of, of power and influence in the world. And everybody would look at Israel and say, yeah, they're the ones. Messiah is that great deliverer in the light of the nations. Jesus, his plan included rejection, execution, and then resurrection. This is a paradigm shift. <sighs> Jesus, you can't do this. We've never heard anything like this. Oh, actually, they had. They had. Some 800 years before, Isaiah wrote about the suffering servant. Look at the words on the screen here. Um, Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. Isaiah 3, 53, there we go. <clears throat> Written by Isaiah about the Messiah, he was despised. Look at the words here. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. You see here that God's purpose was to take our sorrows. This Messiah was to take our sorrows, to bear our griefs, bring us peace with God, to take care of our iniquities. Substitutionary death is what, uh, what is being talked about here. This is completely flip-flopped from the common Jewish thought of the day of just bringing in victory. The way of the cross was God's purpose. And so his mission here is revealed. And then we see the mission is resisted. In verses 32 and 33, you see here, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The 12 are there. There's a bunch of people out in that temple area. And Peter takes him aside to rebuke him. To rebuke him. And Peter reacts with an impertinent, impertinent rebuke. 
what's impertinence, being rude, not showing the respect that's due to somebody of greater importance. He had just said that he was the Christ. And now he's calling him on the carpet. What's up with old Woodenhead? <laughs> Nothing different than what you or I do. Yeah. We often tell God, no, you don't even know what you're doing. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing me to go through this? He's got a plan. We call him Lord. We call him Savior. We call him our, uh, our, our great provider of life. And then we go ahead, and then in the next sentence, we question him. And that's what Peter's doing here. He pulled him aside and began to rebuke him. Matthew 16 says, uh, it adds the, the, uh, the statement that Peter makes, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Whew, yeah, he stepped out where he shouldn't. And immediately Jesus returns a strong rebuttal. Verse 33, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Remember, Peter took him aside. Hey, Jesus, no, you can't be doing this. And Jesus turns to his disciples, and he's going to talk to all of them and Peter, and it's public. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Matthew adds, you're a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Who get behind me, Satan. Well, wait. Just a minute before, Peter had received a revelation from the Father. You are the Christ. And here, get behind me, Satan. And he's talking about what had happened just through Peter. Oh, was Peter possessed by the devil? No, not at all. But the devil, just like with you and me, can whisper in our ears and give us a little thought, and we can act on it. And that's what happened with Peter. And it wasn't very far from what we normally would do. No, that can't happen to you, because we care. Peter cared for Jesus. But he acted impetuously. He acted on a knee-jerk reaction. And that's what we need to be careful about. Lord, let me listen to you. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's where we need to be. And that's where Peter needed to be. But he, Jesus says then, you're not setting your mind on the things of God. On God's purposes. You're setting it on your own or that of mankind. How easy to do. Peter was working through a motive of self-interest. He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. And how easy that can happen for all of this, all of us. We look at this and say, wow, how this turns around. And Jesus continues to tweak the thinking of the disciples. And how much does he want to tweak our thinking? It's not all about us. It's not all about our comfort. God is working his purpose right here with the disciples through this very difficult, difficult time preparing his disciples for the ministry that would happen in six months or so. And that is where we need to be thinking too. What is God doing with us? How does he want us to change our thought processes to where we really truly acknowledge that he is the Christ in our lives, the Messiah, that he is the one who has the plan that he's going to work and he wants to work through us. And what are we doing to inhibit or be a hindrance? As, as Matthew would say, you're a hindrance to me. We certainly don't want that. So 
So the question comes down to us, who do we think Christ is? Who is he to us? Is he the Christ of the Bible? Or is he the Christ of our imagination? Our twisting. Oh, my God wouldn't do that. We better make sure it's the God of scriptures that we're aligning our thoughts. Remember, he is the cornerstone by which we must be aligned. What a beautiful thought. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this word given to us. This object lesson, this visual aid to help us understand that you will build your church on the fact that you are Christ. May we stay true to that because there is salvation in no other name than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we, may we as your church here at Calvary Crossroads hold true to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's.